Part Four: The Public and the Private. Public Policy and Public Law. Public policy, as something purporting to be substantive law, is really only the solemnitude of the latter without true force and effect of law. That subject, in and of itself, is a large topic and beyond the scope and focus of this paper. Public policy is the administration of the bankrupt debtor in possession, the United States Corporation, and its primary focus is the ongoing creation of public funds under the administration of the bankruptcy. It is distinctly identified in House Joint Resolution 192. Passed on June fifth, nineteen thirty-three, wherein the ability to make gold part of the obligation of contracts is suspended to wit, quote, to assure uniform value to the coins and currencies of the United States, whereas the holding of or dealing in gold affect public interest and are therefore subject to proper regulation and restriction. And whereas the existing emergency has disclosed that provisions of obligations which purport to give the obligee a right to require payment in gold or a particular kind of coin or currency of the United States or in an amount in money of the United States measured thereby, obstruct the power of the Congress to regulate the value of the money of the United States. And are inconsistent with the declared policy of the Congress to maintain at all times the equal power of every dollar coined or issued by the United States in the markets and in the payment of debts. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that a. Every provision contained in or made with respect to any obligation which purports to give the obligee a right to require payments in gold or a particular kind of coin or currency or in an amount in money of the United States measured thereby is declared to be against public policy, and no such provision shall be contained in or made with respect to any obligation hereafter incurred. A complete analysis of H.J.R. 192 is beyond the scope of our purpose in this document, but its inclusion as a key part of the creation of the system of bondage is critical. The important and salient point is that this simple one-page resolution established that henceforth Congress is going to be declaring policy and not enacting substantive law, and will prohibit anything that is declared to be against. Public policy. That policy would thereafter be consistent with the vesting into the executive office the unilateral capacity to administer the ongoing bankruptcy of the United States for the a priori purpose of protecting and preserving the monetary policies of said corporation in bankruptcy, as established by the Emergency Banking Relief Act of March ninth, nineteen thirty-three. From that point forward. All purposes and processes of the entire municipal government known as United States will be under the executive office and will be for a singular purpose: that of establishing public policy consistent with the purposes and requirements of the EBRA. In Title I of the EBRA, the following things were established: Number one. In Section One, it provides that all actions, regulations, rules, licenses, orders, and proclamations by the President on or after March Four, nineteen thirty-three, are approved and confirmed. This means that all such regulations, rules, licenses, orders, and proclamations are pre-approved, as the exact wording is heretofore or hereafter. This is what empowers executive orders and other issuances to carry the purported constitutional authority of Congress, because they are pre-approved and confirmed with no termination date of such approval. Number two, the authority to do this was conferred by the Trading with the Enemy Act, as amended, and such amendment is provided in the very next section. 
That amendment pertains to foreign exchange, transfers of payments or credit by banking institutions, and the export, hoarding, melting, or earmarking of gold or silver coin or bullion or currency. This control is extended to any person within the United States or any place subject to the jurisdiction thereof. This will cover all circulating commercial paper, Federal Reserve notes, securities, and the entire public monetary system since transfers of payments or credit by banking institutions pretty well covers it all. And, of course, any place subject to the jurisdiction thereof covers anywhere such United States credit is circulated or held on reserve, i.e., all central banks of the world. Number three, the president, through any agency, think IRS, is then empowered to have access to all related books, accounts, records, and so forth pertaining to the enforcement or investigation related to the oversight and control of this act. And number four, the retroactive element of a March 9th act going back to March 4th is significant because that is the day of FDR's inauguration and March 6th is the day of issuance of Proclamation 2039 wherein he ordered a three-day banking holiday. And then on March 9th, concurrent with the passage of the EBRA, Proclamation 2040 extended the bank holiday indefinitely. Quote, Do hereby proclaim, order, direct, and declare that all the terms and provisions of said proclamation of March 6, 1933, and the regulations and orders issued thereunder, are hereby continued in full force and effect until further proclamation by the President. End quote. Even though all of this might seem very complex to the average reader, with diligent review and allowance of the interlocking nature of these acts and events, along with others identified further below, inclusive of the military nature of the emergencies and declarations of war, whether martial or simply wars on poverty, drugs, terror, or whatever the meme of the day happens to be, in time the interlocking puzzle becomes perfectly clear. Of course, this does not pertain to just the United States, because, as stated above, the Federal Reserve Note has been used as the reserve currency of all central banks worldwide since the advent of the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944. Because of this, all national currencies are really just a subset of the Federal Reserve Note and system, and thus all persons, franchises, using national currencies such as Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, Japanese yen, and so forth, are in fact within the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Notice the use of the word funds as opposed to money a point we shall return to later. The U.S. Corporation was placed into bankruptcy by Executive Proclamation 2039 and extended with Proclamation 2040, concurrent with the passage of the Emergency Banking Relief Act that placed the administration of the bankruptcy in the hands of the United States person occupying the offices of President of the United States of America and President of the United States. Notice the distinction of stating two offices for two different entities, a point that is little understood. Public policy is instituted for the maintenance of the public body. To see how universal this phrase is, do a search for Institute of Public Policy and see how many such institutes there are at state and federal levels. The choice of the word institute is no accident as it means to implement as well as an entity for such purposes, thus institutionalizing this central construct. The public body is the equivalent of the civil body, which takes us back to the Roman civil code. The Latin word civitas, defined as the social body of the civis, or citizens united by law. It is the law that binds them together, giving them responsibilities, munera, on the one hand, and rights of citizenship on the other. The agreement has a life of its own, creating a res publica, or public entity, synonymous with civitas, 
into which individuals are born or accepted and from which they die or are ejected. The civitas is not just the collective body of all the citizens, it is the contract binding them all together. Take note of the two phrases that are highlighted, the first indicating the co-relationship between responsibilities and rights. This is how the function of the civil system is established, by creating the binding contract with the state as the provider of privileges and benefits, civil rights, in exchange for responsibilities, adherence to the binding civil codes of procedure. By acceptance, this establishes the binding contract that is affirmed and reaffirmed over and over again by everyday acts such as writing checks, paying bills, acceptance of licenses, etc., to bind the citizens to the control of the state, which includes the creation of public funds under public policy, binding all the citizens together into the civitas. Further, we must note that the term citizen, a civ from which we derive the word civilian, is ultimately defined as property of the state. Thus, the public or civil body is a containment field, the concept and legal construction of which was created in the Roman period so that those without standing to actually hold an estate could be lifted off the land, held within such containment, and basically chattelized, to coin a phrase, to be contained as the chattel property of the state and thereby to be utilized by what we now call the elite, those with standing. Chattel is movable property, not attached to the land. The word is phonetically related to the words cattle and capital. Cattle are the stock held in the stockyard, the equity value derived from the land upon which they are grazed. They are counted per capita, or by the head. It is no different than the people as chattel property that graze the plantation of the modern economy to create corporate stock as equity that is traded and monetized on the stock market and thereby become capital to be used to create public funds as currency. All colonies of the British were referred to as plantations. As a historical note to understand this point, the civil law, Roman Civil Code, was brought into North America via Louisiana, specifically New Orleans. When the so-called Louisiana Purchase took place, it was actually not what we were taught in school as that whole central swath of North America within the United States. It was specifically the metropolitan area of New Orleans that was actually purchased. All of the land was owned by a sovereign body called the Washita. They are not Indians, as that term is usually applied to native indigenous people of North America. Racially, the Washita are black and have been on the North American continent for 6,000 years as documented by their own historical records. They are the lineal descendants of the Nubian royal race that existed in the whole Egyptian construct, if we go back to the first dynasty starting around 3100 B.C., when we look at the records they discuss the Nubians who were considered the royalty, at the beginning of the 13th dynasty, we see the intrusion of the Hyksos kings in Egypt that lasted for approximately 500 years until the end of the 18th dynasty, roughly 1800 to 1350 BC. This period was all about the Hyksos taking control of the indigenous royal race in Africa who were the original dynastic pharaohs of Egypt. The Hyksos period is characterized by an overlord elite system that did not in fact contribute to society, but operated as a parasite to draw and extract the vitality, life force, out of the social and economic fabric, sound familiar, via the religious, political, economic, monetary, and social systems that were incubated and perfected during that period. When they were finally ejected out of Egypt at the end of the reign of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, they departed in two directions, one to the west and the British Isles, the other to the east and the so-called Holy Land. 
Most have not heard the name Akhenaten, but are more familiar with his other name, Moses. The two areas to which his group dispersed after being expelled from Egypt are the two key grounding points from which to stage the process of world domination and control over the next 3,300 years, and were specifically cited on points of the geomantic system in this world that were known at the time as primary power points. History from that point forward was a process of extending their hegemony worldwide and specifically taking control of many or most of the other power points around the world. To find such power points, one simply has to look at where the points of power and presence are established today. The mechanism that was utilized for this purpose of binding control over the millennia was virtually the same as the political, legal, monetary, religious system we have today. It was designed and perfected then, and has been used over and over ever since. The Nubians were in America as the Olmecs in the area south of what is today called Veracruz on the Caribbean coastline of Mexico, the area with the big stone heads that are negroid in facial features. The Olmecs were established along the Gulf of Mexico coast up through Texas and Louisiana long before the Hyksos descendants arrived there in the early part of the 16th century. In the Louisiana area, they were known as the Washita, and they controlled all that land, a fact fully recognized by treaty before the establishment of the United States and United States of America in 1776 through 1791. The French controlled the city of New Orleans, but did not control the entire swath of land that we were told constituted the purchase in 1803. At the time, Napoleon was in need of funds to continue his war in Europe, so he arranged the sale of New Orleans to the United States. At the same time, he was completing the Napoleonic Code, which was effectively an advancing of the Roman Civil Code that had not been updated since the Justinian Code in the 6th century. Salient to the Napoleonic Code was the advancing of the surname that was to be implemented for the peasantry, where prior to that only the landed gentry had surnames. This established an important binding link to the later introduced corporate franchise. The Justinian Code was itself not a new code of law, but a reorganization of the classical Roman system. Reference to 1803 as a seminal year is based on the concurrence of these two facts, the sale of New Orleans to the United States and the completion of the Napoleonic Code, which in combination brought Roman civil code to the land of North America.